I want to talk to you today about staying alight. Can you say to the person next to you, stay alight? It can be tricky, can't it? Your campfire's lit, and then it starts raining on all that wood you've got. It's not easy, is it, to blaze brightly when somebody's raining on your parade. And um, you may get up, it's Monday morning, heading into work again, signal failures at Acton Town, somebody's off sick, you've got their work to do as well as your own, boss is moaning at you, moan, 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 staying alight in the tricky times. Not always easy, is it? Has it ever occurred to you that God chose you for this season? Sometimes you think, why me, Lord? Why now? Have you not noticed all I've had to go through? But God chose you for the season. I sometimes think it was somewhat illogical that Jesus the Son should come in the pre-internet era. Yeah, how weird, you know, if, he, if it was now, he'd get on telly and Facebook and Instagram and the whole lot. And yet he came in an era when none of that was available. It wasn't even on the, the, the far distant horizon. You know, he never wrote a book even. He never traveled to a big city. And yet the gospel touched every corner of the world and still continues to do so the timing was right and we sometimes think oh god you've dealt me a really miserable hand here in 2020 look at what I've got to do compared to everybody else but you know for you to live in this season must mean God has put inside of you something that is stronger than the season. And sometimes, you know, we can be the people, ah, oh, life just happens to me. But we should be people who make life happen. Amen? And we, we fight that. God has put something in you and me that is greater than the spirit of the age. What does it say, John 8, 12? I am the light of the world. This is Jesus. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In other words, it's God's doing. You know, it says in Isaiah, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord raises up a standard against him. What's a standard? You know, in battle, they used to raise something like a flag or something. So, ah, I know I'm a fighter. I must rally to that particular standard. It's raised up and God lifts us up in order to meet the scale of the challenge. I have some props. Hope you don't mind. As illustration. Let me have a look different pieces. hope I've remembered them all. And I need a, um, a helper, if I may. So if someone wants to come forward, I need somebody with a very steady hand, so nobody who's been... <laughs> no one who's been drinking last night, you know, hands wobbling. Oh, there we go. Oh, definite, definitely not. We're in very safe hands. <laughs> watch it later on the tape and fast forward all the other bits I have got for us here an ancient device for lighting how many of you got one of these in your house small but highly effective and indeed in their era they were all they had so that's what they used. 
Pastor Temi, do you want to just come forward? Hold this very steady. There we go. Can we dim the lights? Now, it's a small thing, but it's also perfectly formed. And if I light it, you'll see. Anybody not see that? It's small, isn't it? But we can see exactly what's going on. And we're not plunged into total darkness in here, but if it were the middle of the night, and it was literally pitch black, that's the only light you have to, to depend on, everybody would see it. Everybody would, would notice it. And it's very small but visible much, much further than you think. So the flame is very, very tiny, but even if you were right at the back of the LTC, even if you were outside and all the walls were over you, open the doors, you would see that thing glowing very, very bright. And it's not just about the size of the light that makes a difference, but the amount of darkness that it dispels. And you may well find in your life that people see your light who are much, much further away than you think. You think, oh, well, I didn't think anybody really noticed because I didn't have much of a contact with them or much of a relationship with them. But people are, are watching and seeing. And they see, even from a great distance, the light that you carry. It's not the size of the light that matters, but the purity. And the darker it gets, the more visible it is. And I guarantee you, when you have the light of Christ in your life, people notice it. People notice it. It dispels a lot of darkness. Thank you, Pastor Temi. All gone. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Very stable hand. To have a fire, you need three elements. Anybody a chemicals expert here? You need oxygen, heat, and fuel. Oxygen, heat, and fuel. So if you have all three of those things, you can have a fire, right? They call it the fire triangle. And a fire extinguisher, if we were to take one of these fire extinguishers off the wall and use it on the, 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 the fire, they're designed to take one of those things out, yeah? So if it's water, fine. If it's powder, it, it, it's targeting something as well. But you remove any one of the three sides of the triangle and suddenly, bang, the, the fire is no longer there. And you see, sometimes we are surrounded by fire extinguishers. Aren't we? When we get up on a Monday morning, it's raining and people are moaning and you've got a cold and the tube's del delayed yet again. You, we, we are confronted by a fire extinguisher of, of sorts. But our job is what? To remain lit in all circumstances. And just as for a fire you need oxygen and heat and fuel... To be on fire for God needs three vital components. Anybody know what they are? God, number one. Number two, you. You and me are needed, right? We, we are part of the action here. We're part of the fire and there's a problem if we're not there. And number three, we need faith. We need faith. 1 John 1, 8 to 11, it says this. A new commandment. I write to you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, to have a successful fire, you absolutely sort of need those components. But we need to remain 
lit, right? You get some Christians, you think, I remember, you know, back in the 90s, we did a lot of like door knocking, door-to-door evangelism, we used to call it. And sometimes you, you would knock on the door. This would be very common. It'd be rare that you do an evening of this and you wouldn't get this sort of reply. You'd knock on the door, hello, hello. I'd say, oh, are you a Christian? He said, yes, I am a Christian, but I do it in my own way. It's just me. I just do it on my own. I don't go to church. It's just me. You know, and we all have met those sort of types of people. But you need to be with other people to keep the fire going, don't you? You know, it, it's not just our job to, to get lit in the way that you would strike a match, but it's our job to keep on fire. And if you have like a burning coal that's really, really hot and you take it out of the fire and set it on the hearth, after a while it will, will grow cold. You know, God wants us to be with each other. We need the fuel of each other to keep going. And the enemy sometimes does a really good job of isolating people. You know, even gives them a philosophy. I don't need anybody. It's just me and God, you know, the way the ancient sort of hermits were. But God has other ideas. It's our job to remain lit and on fire for him. Number two, I have something else. I couldn't get one bigger. They should be bigger. Anybody know what one of these is? A lighthouse. We are also called to be light lighthouses. I remember there's a a lovely lighthouse on the east coast of Britain in a little town called Southwold. And you visit it in the middle of summer. It's a lovely day. Got like a lovely pier. Kids playing on the beach, all that type of stuff. And um, the, the lighthouse is really pretty. It's like whitewashed, set against like a clear blue sky. You think, what a love. You know those like chocolate box images of Britain? It's one of those. And it looks like that on a summer's day. But it's not the job of a lighthouse just to look pretty. You know, sometimes people say, you know, I'm a good-looking Christian. You know, I, I do the right things, and I, I have all the right clothes, and I, I say the right stuff, and, and I look good. Say to the person next to you, you look good. You look good. And you do look good. But being a Christian is about more than just looking good in the spirit There's another purpose as well. And a lighthouse has another purpose too. In the middle of the storm, it needs to stay lit. Suddenly the environment is transformed. The sea is no longer peaceful. It's dark and it needs to warn shipping that there are dangers. And that very same place, the little town where I used to go to, looks really, really beautiful, but there are some very, very treacherous sandbanks just off the coast. Uh, and the lighthouse was built in the late 1800s to, to warn shipping. They say, stay away. It all looks safe, but beneath the sea, not even rocks, but very, very perilous sandbanks. And you get your ship stuck in that. You don't easily sort of reverse yourself back out again. So from the late 1800s, really to the early years of this century, that lighthouse was not just a nice to have to make people's photos on holiday look really, really nice. It was an essential thing to, to warn off people. So it looked nice, but it came into its own in the darkness, in the storms when there was pressure, when people needed guidance and needed warning away from danger. We turn to Matthew 5, 14 to 16. You see, a lighthouse is all about position. There's no point in sticking your lighthouse at the bottom of a valley. What's the point of that? Useless. It needs to be in a point of prominence in the right place. They're by the coast, aren't they? Because they are warning shipping. They're not just a nice to have, nice background, looks really, really good. It's really important that it's in the right spot, that we have it 
in the right spot and, and, and that it's correctly positioned. And just so with God, it's important that we are in the right position. Matthew 5.14 says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. They cannot be hidden. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. God wants you to be in the right place. And sometimes you can have all the right things, but you just feel, God, I'm in the wrong spot. You know, when they invented bubble wrap, everybody know what bubble wrap is? Use it for wrapping and also, you know, de-stressing, press the little things. It was originally designed as wallpaper. They got two shower curtains, put them together with bubbles. In them. This is going to be a great product. You know, we, we, people put it on their wall. It's insulating, helps your house stay warm. Who wants that on their wall? Absolutely nobody. Useless. So nobody wanted it as wallpaper. Then they decided to sort of sell it as, you know, greenhouse insulation. You know, you put it around your greenhouse in the winter, keeps the plants warm. Again, you know, not, not bad, but not quite the thing. Then they discovered just the right use for it. Ah, wrapping up delicate stuff when you put it through the post. Genius. And, of course, they found with the qualities that it had, the right place for it. Viagra was originally designed to lower blood pressure. And then when they were doing the tests, they found it had a, another property as well. So it can lower blood pressure, but in the right circumstances, you do something else as well. So we, you see the things, you can find these things, but they don't always end up in exactly the place you thought they'd be. In 1928, there was a doctor, Alexander Fleming. He worked in St. Mary's Hospital in London. Paddington's still there, isn't it? A and he left a, a Petri dish out, you know, one of those little sort of dishes. And it had a load of Staphylococcus bacteria on it. And when he came back from holiday, he, he looked into his lab uh, and he saw there was some mould gr growing on top of the bacteria. I thought, mm, that's interesting. Looked at it up under a microscope. Could see the mould, see some of the Staphylococcus. Uh, and he could see that some of the bacteria around the mould had died. He thought, ooh, that's weird. Why would that be the case? And he realised there was a substance in the mould that killed bacteria. Uh, and he realised the substance was penicillin uh, and could have a very powerful effect in terms of treating illness. And this was 1928, so it was a good number of years before it could be, like, purified. Because that's the thing, you don't want loads of mould in, in medicine. It was a long time before they could isolate the thing, the, the active ingredient. But they did so, and it was a breakthrough. And you can sometimes think, God... You know, I've got the right gifts, but I'm just in the wrong spot. A and I need God to move me to the right place where you are that city on a hill. You are that lighthouse doing the right stuff in the right place. You know, is this your year in 2024 for God to move you into the right position? Not just functioning right, which is very important, but that position of promotion. Because there's no good having a light, says in the Bible, under a bushel. A light under a bushel. There's no point in that. It can be really lovely. We could have lit that candle, but if it, if it had been around the corner or around the back, you wouldn't have seen it. But it, it's the position of prominence that matters. And I believe 2024 is a year of people moving into the right place. So the glorious shining is seen by other people and, and, and noticed by them. And I believe this is your time of coming forward where God will place you in the position that matters. God has you in that season for a reason. You know, Moses, genetically, he was a Hebrew, right? That was in his genes. It was in his DNA. But experientially, 
He was an Egyptian. He was raised in Pharaoh's household, no less. And sooner or later in Moses' life, there was going to come a, a reckoning where the, 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 the call of God is going to come into direct conflict with the experience. Have you ever driven a car where you're trying to select fourth gear and instead fourth gear is quite close to second gear? Uh, have you ever done it, driven a manual I thought, trying to select fourth and ah, I've accidentally selected second and you're dropping far too much speed on the gear. The gearbox lets you know about it, doesn't it? You get a kind of whirring of cogs and teeth coming off the cogs and sort of things like that. It's not meant to be like that. There's a, a graunching of the gears, a grinding of the gears, you know. And, and sometimes, you know, we have over here, we have background, experience, upbringing, what our mum and dad have told us to do, everything we've ever learned, where we've grown up, educational qualifications, all that sort of stuff. And over here, over here, we've got the call of God where God wants you to be, what God has called you to be, and what God has said he wants you to be. And over here, we've got all the other things, cultural expectation, nationality, what I should do, what other people have told me. And over here, we've got call of God, call of God, call of God. And at some point, there's going to be a... <coughs> crunching of the gears because God it's not that all of that is irrelevant don't get me wrong I'm not saying there's anything wrong with nationality but God wants you to fulfill his call and his expectation and his authority you know Moses experienced that didn't he killed the Egyptian slave master who'd beaten the Hebrew and Moses had to disappear off into Midian for quite some time you don't need to go into the story, but burning bush and sort of God speaks to him. You know, that was the grinding of the gears for Moses. But he needed to be positioned right. He needed to be positioned right. In the same way as the lighthouse needs to be set on high. So God is calling many of us to change position that the light we exemplify is nicely visible. Let me give you something else that is nicely visible and which you wouldn't want to miss. Get out your cameras if you have one. Thank you very much. It's important we're not dull in this year. Isn't that right? Say to the person next to you, don't be dull. You'd be anything you like, but not dull. We need to put on the armour of God every day. Truth, gospel, faith, all that Ephesians 6 stuff. And when the atmosphere is heavy, you need to don it all the more. You know, when it's really cold outside and it's snowing, you need to wear extra clothes. Don't you take extra care? Have I got my gloves? Have I got my hat? Am I wrapped up right? You don't just go out in sort of short and t-shirt. And so it is in challenging circumstances. It's important. Ephesians 5 8 says this, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You know, dullness doesn't reflect the glory of God. And we can be dull. You know, you can have a, a beautiful candlelight, but if it's in a, a really messy kind of glass holder, the purity of the light won't shine through. And God wants us to be clean and refreshed and showing off his light in the right way. In the right way. 
Hebrews 12.1, it says, Lay aside every weight and run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus. And sometimes, you know, we can drag into the new year all the baggage of the old. You know, all those, oh, God, that thing that didn't happen in 2023. Oh, same old job, same old situation. And God says, I want you to take off the heavy garments, the dull garments, the sackcloth, if you like, of old, and leave them in 2023. You put on the lightness of his shining, glorious, reflective garment. I think you will all agree this is a, a glorious, reflective garment. You will have your own suggestions and ideas, no doubt. But we need to be dressed right, spiritually, in God. You know, a, a winemaker, if he's making wine takes the grapes, he grows the grapes. Grapes are all on the vine, doing really well. Great, ah, oh, it's lovely. Just as they're doing really well, what does he do? Snip, 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 snip. Gets the grapes, crushes the grapes, ferments the grapes, turns them into wine, puts them in the bottle. And once he's done that, there's no going back, is there? The grape can't say, ah, oh, hang on a minute. I really wanted to be on the vine, you know, with all the insects and the, the frosts and the heat of summer and the, the fungus and the diseases and sort of all of that. I mean, even if the grape wants to go back there, it's irrelevant because the grape has been turned into wine. So the wine skins lie dead and inert and useless on the floor. They're, they're just rubbish. They might get fed to pigs, but they're of no use. Because the grape has produced the juice that produces the wine. And sometimes we can feel like that. Oh, God, I want to go back to normal. Please make things normal. God says there is no new normal. It's a contradiction in terms. It's a different place. And we can feel squeezed and crushed. And you think, Ah, get me back in the grape skin law. But God says, look, I'm in the business of making fine wine. That was all right for a season, but you were there growing until I had you at just such a point. Snip, 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 snip. Chateau Latour, Grand Collins. Chateau Latour, Grand Jackson. Temi Awushu, you know, God wants us to be perfect in him. And God knows what he's doing. There is no new normal. You know, everything is disruptive. If you want to plant a tree, the tree disrupts the ground. Just don't let the disruption become a distraction. You know, God is moving you from glory to glory. And be tempted to think, ah, oh, get me back in the, the old wineskin. It was nice there, knew how it worked. And I was really comfortable. And some of my friends were there as well. And they didn't want to come into the new state, you know. But God says, I've got something greater for you. I've got something greater. You know, we need, if we're going to shine properly, to take off the garments of old and put on the new one. Numbers 6, 24, 26. One of the most beautiful verses of the Bible, it says this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You know, we're there to reflect the glory reflect the glory you can do a lot of reflecting can't you when my dad was a kid kid they lived um my granddad was a farmer and uh, they had a farmhouse right on the top of the hill and uh, my granny i don't know whether women still have these but had like a dressing table any of you have like a big dressing table massive mirror massive mirror at the front so you have one there one there get yourself ready in the morning do always my granny would would use this thing but my dad um, would regularly, on a nice sunny day, bear in mind the farmhouse, nice high point, unscrew this massive mirror 
and he was a little boy, and he would carry it. It's a huge, great thing. It's like plate, glass job like this. would get it, hang out the window, uh, and he would catch the sunlight in the mirror. And he would concentrate it when he saw like a passing car uh, on the road, <laughs> so down below. He'd get the mirror like this and like beam it, like Icarus style, into the window of the, of the passing car. You know, and invariably what would happen, they'd pull off uh, and, um, you know, knock at the door of the farmer. I said, I don't know what happened there. Got hit by a blinding light. Uh, and my granny was so, oh, I'm, I just don't know what's happened there. I have no idea sort of whatsoever. And then afterwards, when they'd gone, she got the stairs, Roderick, what did you do? It's just reflecting a greater light in a powerful way. You can do a lot of reflecting with the mirror of your life, but all you are doing is reflecting the power of God. When God's sunshine of God's love comes upon you, you beam it back into the life of somebody else. Can we dim the lights yet again? I've got something else. I borrowed off Victor. He's got to make sure he gets it back if he's lucky or well behaved. Anybody seen one of these babies? <laughs> a lightsaber which crashes through the dark. Anybody use one of these? <laughs> Beloved of Star Wars. And God equips us with something else. And you can use whatever analogy you want, but God's word is like a weapon in our hand, like a light unto our feet. What does the Bible say? Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. God has given that for the purposes of illumination. Let's have the lights back on, see you all. Provides clear light and direction. God doesn't want us to be without direction and instruction and knowing where we're going, whatever happens. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God, it says, is sharper than any two-edged sword, living and powerful, better than any lightsaber. It's like God's cosmic lightsaber when we read and when we instruct ourselves and how much we need. In order to keep aglow, you need God's word pouring into your spirit. You know, what you say to yourself brings healing. You know, the woman who had the issue of the blood over many, many years. She sees Jesus and she could have thought, ah, oh, there's a lot of people there. You know, I can always come tomorrow. Jesus is always there another day. Not today, maybe. Loads of crowds. But what did she say? She said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment I will be made whole Jesus didn't tell her that the disciples didn't want that she hadn't studied in theology she hadn't gone to Bible college and somebody had taught her that it was God's faith in her mouth that brought healing to her what you say is important. Jesus said, turn to her and say, your faith has made you whole. What a radical suggestion. It wasn't to do with her uh, learning. It wasn't to do with carefully worked out theology. It was simple faith. Jesus will heal me. Jesus says, you shall have whatever you say. And in this year, so, so important that we follow God's word and take it deep. 
God wants us to shine and shine brightly. And our responsibility is to reflect that, is to be that, is to shine brightly in the Lord and keep the flame lit. Let's stand in his presence, shall we? Lord, we thank you that your face shines upon us, Lord. There's many things about us that are dull and lacking, and we have all sorts of distractions that come our way. But God, when the world gets darker, Lord, we get brighter and lighter in you. And Lord, we thank you that you are the supernatural lighthouse keeper and candle maker. That Lord, you keep us lit. You keep us shining, Lord God, for you. And Lord, we take off, Lord Jesus, the heavy burdens that 2023 tried to put upon us. And Lord, we run free and run with endurance to the finishing line with you in your mighty and powerful name. And I want to give a chance to respond. You remember we taught right at the start about that fire triangle. And God has a fire triangle for each one of us. It consists of God, you, and faith. Simple faith in him. And if you've never placed your faith in him you can't have that supernatural fire that God wants for you so just now whilst every eye is closed in this place while the focus is just on God you're at liberty to just put your hand up and say I want this life of which you speak I want to give my life firmly and unequivocally to the Lord so if that's you I want you just whilst every eye is closed in this place, just to put your hand up, just so we acknowledge it and recognize it. It's just between you and God and me, nobody else. And we'll pray for you. In fact, we'll pray all together just to welcome God in. And we say together, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for me. I thank you for the love that you have for me. And I ask for your forgiveness for the things I've done wrong and the things that have stopped me shining brightly and I invite you into my heart to set me free and be my saviour from this day and forevermore in Jesus mighty name Amen and Amen thank you guys God bless you Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Keep the flame lit. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for such.